So, so my name is Marlena Gavik. I work at the University of Szczecin. I'm the Irish lecturer there. So if you want to actually learn some Irish, that's uh, the place you should go. Uh, I also do research in um, language policies, but also contemporary Irish literature. So yeah, that would be uh, a few words about myself. And we also have Koan today. So. The Yiv, a Khwarja, Kuan O'Sharatan, is Anam Dum. Um I'm the um Kamadi or Kushtos at Conor Nagelia um in our headquarters in Dublin. Um and my work consists of taking care of the history and the heritage of the organization. I'll tell you more about the organization during the lecture. Um but it's a very wide range of activities because it's a very old organization which was involved in many things over the years and played a key role in the development of the Irish state, um, in the emergence of the Irish state and in the character of that state and its institutions and had a huge cultural impact. And we'll be talking a little bit about how that happened um, in a few minutes. So shall we begin the presentation, perhaps put it up on the screen? Okay. Permit to slash Martian. Oh, screen, go. So can you all see the screen? Uh, sharing, no, sharing now. Can you all see it now? I can. Okay. Muskel de Vishnach Avanba. Shasach Nagail Gula Laguling. Awaken your courage, Banba, a literary name for Ireland. Shasach Nagail. May the Gaels, the Irish, stand. Gula Laguling, shoulder to shoulder. This is a drawing that really expresses, in a lot of ways, the spirit of the revival. It comes from a scrapbook which was used in a shop, a gathering place, a tobacco shop in Dublin, run by a guy called Cahal McGarvey. And people would come in there and smoke, drink whiskey, and talk, and enter things in this scrapbook. And the scrapbook tells us a lot about their private thoughts about the revival and the development of the revival in the early years of the 20th century. Uh, and uh, it's a really rich source for giving us an insight into their mood and mentality at different times. We'll talk maybe a little bit about the context of this, why some kind of revival was necessary in Ireland, why it was happening. But first, we'll do a little comparison between the language situation historically in Poland and in Ireland. Um, and we'll take a look at Poland first. Let me see if I can move my slides on here. There we go. So, Poland. Perhaps, Marlene, you'd like to talk about this a little bit. So I'm going to say a few words, uh, but to start with, um, I would like to say that it's really hard uh, to compare Poland and Ireland um, language-wise or in terms of the language, uh, let's say, history and development. So, I mean, uh, you will see in a moment that the situations were very different and probably it would require some more research, um, you know, to see uh, why today we have the the results we have but uh okay so as far as some anti-polish measures are concerned you see um we can say we, we can start with 1744 where um, polish was not allowed in courts in uh, the region of silesia there were some measures uh before but this had rather little impact so we start from here and then um you see by the way, here I marked it, or you know, in green, you see the measures uh, taken by um, you know the Prussia, then later Germany, and the red stands for uh, Russia. So you see, we have like two oppressors. Uh, so there are different measures taken in different places uh, at different periods of times. But anyway, yeah, and then. Here might be an uh, important date. Uh, so 1763, 1803, we have Federation colonization. So basically a lot of German people were brought uh, to live in Poland. So that also affected the language situation. 
then uh, okay on the Russian side let's say uh, in 1832 uh, same and Polish army were dissolved and Russian law and institutions introduced um, the, in the um, area of a Russian uh, partition then 1833-1834, several thousands of Polish families were displaced for Boeing and Podola. So when you get read of Polish speakers, that also affects the language. And uh, this was actually the case in Ireland too, at some point. And then here a into 85 you have systematic removal of the Polish language from the education system and uh, well, Polish became a non-compulsory subject uh, at school. And uh, well, so you will also see probably that this is also common uh, in terms of say colonization or oppression when you want you know, to get rid of people's language, you very often start with uh, kind of forbidding it at school. Uh, so similar situation um, or similar measure taken by, um, by you know, in terms of German or by uh, yeah, by, the, by Prussia. And then also German replaced Polish as a language of courts and administration uh, in the whole uh, area of German partition, but it was 1876. Then uh, there were Prussian deportations, so mass expulsions of ethnic Poles. So again, you know, getting rid of the indigenous people. And uh, 1894, 1914, we have German Eastern Marches Society. So in Polish, we know it better as Hakata. And you know, these included uh, a series of anti-Polish measures. So, you know, a lot of actions, uh, activities directed at um, getting rid of the Polish language. And then you might be familiar uh, with the strike in where religion was to be taught through German and the pupils, the children uh, from this school, uh, simply refused and erected without the constant of German authorities. So here you might be familiar with Drzymawe, who decided, that, okay, because no permanent buildings maybe can be erected, he would uh, live in a caravan and, so, and you know, just move this uh, vehicle, you know, from one place to another. And so you might be uh, well aware of that. Um, yeah, so you see, and then uh, we have the First World War, which was, you know, basically an ethnic cleansing. So these weren't just measures um, directed at getting rid of the Polish language as such, but, you know, they were directed at um, Polish people and so on. And yeah, so basically that's, these are some major, let's say, events um, from the Polish history that had effect um, or were to have an effect on the language. So I guess we can now say a few words uh, about Ireland. And when we were talking about that list earlier on, putting this together, the thing that stood out for Marlena and me was that the list of measures taken in Poland to repress the Polish language from both the Prussian and the Russian um, authorities, or colonizing uh, powers, they were quite targeted, quite direct and they took place over a period of about 160 years. Um, but prior to that, a Polish state had existed and Polish institutions had existed. In the Irish case, it's a bit different. The Irish state, there was no Irish state, centralized Irish state, the uh, beginning of British colonization in Ireland, or I should really say English colonization in Ireland. Uh, the, the first involvement of the Normans and later the English in Ireland dates from around the 1160s, so a much earlier period. And of course, that kind of a power is not a very powerful centralized state. And generally at that time, uh, territories moved between different groups. The culture didn't really change that quickly in, in, in most areas. And, this, and the central authorities, such as they were, didn't have a huge amount of interest in those areas. But during the initial colonization of Ireland, the colonizers who moved from England um, or from France to live in Ireland, they tended to integrate themselves into the local population and adapt the culture, intermarry, 
and they often became what were called in Ireland the Old English. So they were allied and had allegiance to the British crown or the English crown, but they actually were culturally very Irish and participated in and encouraged indigenous Irish arts and bards and so on. And in response to that problem and a feeling in London that that was leading to a loss of authority of English power in Ireland, in 1367, the statutes of Kilkenny were passed, making it illegal for English colonists to speak Irish in Ireland and illegal for the Irish to speak Irish to English colonists. This was an attempt to stop that integration. Then almost 200 years later, uh, they realized that even that that's not enough. You have a statute for Ireland, the Act for the English Order, Habit and Language, ban on use of Irish in the Irish Parliament. There was a parliament, sometimes in Kilkenny, sometimes in Dublin, uh, uh, which was subject to the authority of the English Crown, but which sat in Ireland. That parliament continued to exist until 1800. Then 1541, uh, further ban on the use of Irish language, the Irish language in areas under English control. Uh, the reason I have the Battle of Kinsale in there is that until that time, there was a sort of a, an Irish nobility to continue to exist and exercise some form of power, albeit at a local level in Ireland, and consistently managed to create a challenge, an organized military challenge to English uh, Crown authority in Ireland. But after 1601, we really see that begin to disappear. A lot of the nobility leave, settle in France and Spain, constantly plotting, of course, to return with armies and with friends from those countries, but never quite managing to make it happen. And by the end of the 17th century, uh, the Irish nobility is really not in a position to play a role in challenging English authority in Ireland. That also means that their power of patronage to encourage the arts and poetry and the, and the higher registers of language also begins to disappear. And with the advent of um, King William and the, what they call the Protestant ascendancy in Ireland, uh, the, the Reformation means that it's more difficult for the populations to mix because Generally, the Irish population, generally, this is very general, they tend to remain Catholic and generally the colonists uh, become Protestant um, and, and, so, and, and there are measures introduced actually to repress Catholicism and to encourage Protestantism. This stops intermarriage really to a large extent and it also means that uh, they, they very directly ban the use of the Irish language in the courts. Then there's the Act of Union in 1801, partly a response to the 1798 rebellion. Um, and all of that is leading to a gradual disintegration of institutional uses in Ireland. It continues to be strong among the general population who tend to, especially if they live in urban areas, become more and more bilingual. So they can do a little bit of business if they're bringing their uh, animals to the town to sell, they'll do that business in English. But when they're at home with their family and their community, they're still living in Irish. This begins to change in the, in the early 19th century as the national school system is established. Irish is not being taught officially in those schools. Some teachers do it on their own initiative. This is a very strong anglicizing influence because, of course, with an increasingly large population, people are wondering what the future of their kids is, is going to be. Having English language classes available in the local area at very, very low cost and of very high quality plays a big role in the language shift. But the key event that really tips it over the edge is the famine, which begins in 1845. And the famine has a profound influence on Irish demographics. Just take a look at this chart very quickly. Uh, the population of Europe uh, from 1801 to 1901 doubles. It increases from about 150 million to about 300 million. The population in Ireland initially also almost doubles from 5.5 million to up to 8.2 million in the 1841 census. So the census was taken every 10 years at that time, so that's, that's the best measurement we have. 10 years later, it's already down to 6.6, .6, and it continues to decline. It actually continues to decline until the 1960s, um, and then even and declines again in the 1980s, and the Irish population has only begun to increase at a consistent rate since the 1990s, such as the profound demographic effect of the famine. There are five years where the potato harvests fail uh, and 
it's a whole issue in itself. But re the, the very rough estimates are that in the immediate aftermath of this crisis, about a million people, a million and a half die, about a million and a million and a half flee the country as quickly as they can. And then there are waves of emigration in the years afterwards. And the, a lot of the cultural values, the societal values change. And one of the main things that changes is the language use, because the famine tends to affect the areas which are more marginal, which are poorer, where the population is in a rural area, but very dense, and they tend to be Irish speaking. So a lot of them die, a lot of them leave. And what also happens is there's a real sense that the cultural vitality is gone. And parents, there's almost a moral panic in many communities about the future of the children. And it changes things like marriage patterns. People marry later and have fewer children. People really, from a very young age, prepare their children for emigration. They stop dividing the land in the same way they used to, and they tend to give all of the land to one child, and the other kids are expected really to be, uh, as is said in a famous phrase in the 1930s, the Irish are raising their children for export. It's a very stark phrase, but it really uh, encapsulates the attitude of a lot of parents. And if they're going overseas, they're probably going to England, they're probably going to America. And if they go to England or America, and they go over there and they can't speak English, they will be at a profound disadvantage. So there's a huge push to learn the English language in Ireland at that time. It's a very long process over many centuries, finally, so, and, and it disappears from the elite. And then in the mid 19th century, it gets this massive hit. and There's a huge, very sudden decline. This causes a lot of conversation in Ireland among academics and a lot of people who are very worried about this. Um, most of the early Irish uh, nationalist movements, separatist movements, Republican movements, early Republican movements, they're not really talking much about Irish culture. In 1798 rebellion, it's just not a theme. Uh, that's very much influenced by American and French republicanism. Um, it's an enlightenment philosophy. The idea of cultural nationalism is just not really in the ideology. But in 1848, the, the, that's the movement actually which produces the modern Irish flag, the Irish tricolor. Uh, they are actually beginning to talk about our language and how language is the distinctive mark of a country and that language actually is a proof that you have an entitlement to run your own affairs, that you have your own natural community and, and the language proves uh, that you are a distinctive nation and could and should be a distinctive state. <clears throat> and initially, um, the interest in the Irish language is confined, uh, the academic, political interest in the Irish language is confined to a small group of intellectuals, many of whom are Protestant. There's a movement internationally to start collecting folklore and looking at national cultures and taking an interest in anthropology and costumes and so on. And some of these intellectuals in places like Dublin are wondering what all of these people in the countryside uh, are doing, what stories they have, um, why are they so different from the people in the cities. Uh, is there anything interesting? Is there anything distinctive about them? And they begin to collect some of this uh, stuff, go out and talk to them about folklore. They begin to write some of these stories down. So it's a, it's a very, they, they're collecting, they're drawing on it, but there isn't really a huge amount of uh, encouragement going on or any sort of idea of um, saving this language or uh, encouraging its use in any systematic way. That begins to change in the late 1880s and the 1890s. A few organizations are formed. Uh, one of them is what's called Eintracht na Gaeilge, the, the Gaelic Union. They start a magazine called Irish Lauer na Gaeilge, and it finds some very young and enthusiastic readers. One of them is Owen McNeil, who was born in County Antrim. And Owen McNeil is a young legal clerk who moves to Dublin and just becomes captivated by the Irish language, really, really interested in it, learning, finding teachers. At one point, he's spending 25% of his income on classes. Uh, he gets permission to go into the, the Royal Irish Academy and study the ancient manuscripts, and he's picking up the grammar and figuring out the language from there. And in March 1893, he's asked by the editor of Irish Lauer na Gaelge, the Gaelic Journal, to write an article about the state of the Irish language and what, if anything, can be done. And he writes this article called how harm is glass ibrach and glusachte the gaige the charai in Ern, a plea and a plan for the re revival of the Irish language in Ireland. And he states the set of points, what the current situation is, 
and maybe what could be done. And again, he makes this key point, the question of an Irish language movement until now has only animated academics and people in the cities. We must get out into the countryside and engage with the population who are still speaking the Irish language, show them that they're valued, show them that their culture has importance, reinvigorate them with confidence and at least save the Irish language, if not revive it. And this article produces a real stir in certain circles. Several letters are written into the Irish Laurinaguega offices uh, responding to this anonymous article. And one of them is from Douglas Hyde. And the editor of the journal gives all of the addresses to uh, Owen McNeil. And Owen McNeil writes to all of the people who have responded to his article, writing and in inviting them to a meeting in Dublin to see can they do something about this? And one of the people he writes to is Douglas Hyde, a, the son of a Protestant rector who, as a young boy, became extremely interested in the culture around him. As a 13, 14 year old, spending a lot of time on his own, he hung around a lot with a gamekeeper, a Fenian gamekeeper on the land called Seamus Hart, and drank whiskey and listened to stories and learned Irish from him. And having learned ancient Greek and Latin in his homeschooling, he realized the value and the richness and the wealth of the culture that existed in the Irish language community around him. I and mean, again, he became almost evangelical in his interest in the Irish language. So he's really engaged by MacNeil's article and responds to MacNeil's invitation to the meeting. There's a picture of Hyde later in life. This picture was actually taken in America. We don't have time to talk about that today. And this is a picture of him later on uh, as president of Conor Nagelia, uh, listening to somebody making a point at a meeting. Again, that's a theme for another day, but in his letter, and as you can see here, this is a really interesting piece of writing at that time. Uh, he's using a lot of shorthand from the ancient Irish manuscripts and so on. He says to MacNeil, Ahi Yilish, Gramagat son the litter, Kinalta, uh, thanks for your letter. I am of exactly the same mind as you. Nothing needs to be done more now than to keep the Irish language being spoken, and that's underlined amongst the people. Um, and he explains why this is really so necessary, and it's, we really need to, to engage with these people, get out there and create a community organization. That is, that is really interacting with the Irish speaking communities, encouraging them, trying to lift their self confidence and show them that their culture has value, and draw on that then to encourage the use, uh, the learning, and interest in the Irish language in the cities. So they meet in Dublin on the 31st of July, 1893, on O'Connell Street. And there's only eight of them in the room. They later, they, you know, they, there's so, such little interest in the meeting that. McNeil is taking guys up from the forecourts on his lunch break to pack the room. Uh, and they signed this document and they found an organization which they call the Gaelic League, Conra, the Gaelia. And the idea is that they call it the Gaelic League because there's a successful organization called the Land League there already. And they think that they can take a little bit of that branding and hopefully create a similar kind of success. And their main aim is, as Hyde says in his letter, to keep the Irish language being spoken. It's not actually a massively ambitious aim, although it is quite a, a challenging task that they lay out for themselves. And uh, as Hyde has explained in his letter, like nobody has done any language planning before. And the only sort of language policies that have ever existed in any direct way from any state have been repressive measures, banning people from doing certain things or using certain languages in certain contexts. Nobody has ever tried to encourage language use in the same way before. So they're trying to invent the wheel here, reinvent the wheel here with this, or actually invent the wheel, because there's no wheel. And they have, the, the main idea they come up with is, well, what do you do if you're trying to set up an organization or campaign? You, literally, you go around and you start, see if you can find interested people. You engage them in conversation. You find out what they're thinking. You try to sell them on your ideas. Well, they're constantly talking about we need to get out of the cities, into the countryside, and talk to these communities, and bring them in, and talk to them. 
there's no money to do this. So for the first few years, Conor Negrega continues to be a mainly urban phenomenon. Uh, there are even branches in places like New York and Boston and London uh, and Glasgow before there are branches in some of the rural areas in Ireland. They work away and by 1897, they have 30 or 40 branches. They're still saying, we just, we need to do this. We don't have the money to do this and we need to collect money in some way or find some funding to get working on this plan. And they get lucky because a man called Patrick Mullen dies in Brooklyn and leaves money for the revival of the Irish language. Patrick Mullen was born in Ballyshannon, Donegal, around 1814-1815, left, went to America, became a gunsmith, expert gun maker, in, a, in the very wealthy uh, society in New York, you know, the Gilded Age Society of the 1880s and early 1890s. He made a lot of money selling spectacular handmade one-off guns to the elite in New York and had a great reputation as a result and made a lot of money. And some of this money was left to the Irish language. Now we don't know really why he was particularly interested in Irish. Perhaps he was a native speaker. Uh, perhaps he, he felt that maybe uh, like the young Irelanders or the old Fenians that encouraging Irish culture might also lead to a reinvigoration of Irish separatism. We just don't know. That's research that needs to be done. Well, he left this money and he appointed a member of parliament of the Irish party, T.D. O'Sullivan, as the executor of his estate. Now this, um, this uh, row went on for several years and it took a while to sort out what to do with the money. But just as a very small diversion, I was really surprised and it's funny the, where research takes you sometimes, but actually Patrick Mullen's guns are a big collector's item in the United States still. And I found one for sale. I didn't buy it, I must say. <laughs> but I found one for sale in Texas of all places. And um, it's quite a spectacular, quite a spectacular looking gun. And if you guys are ever looking for one or in the market for one and need to learn how to spot a fake, it's actually really easy because he signed all his guns. So if you see P. Mullen written, as you can see there under the barrel, then it's a genuine Patrick Mullen uh, shotgun or rifle. And um, you can feel comfortable that, you won't, that your money won't be wasted. Um, so the money arrived in Ireland anyway, and it was being administered by T.D. O'Sullivan, this MP. And various Irish language groups were invited to a conference at the Mansion House. That's the residence of the Lord Mayor in Dublin. There's a huge function room called the Round Room. This room also plays a key role in Irish history later on as the room where the first sitting of Doyle Éireann, the new independent Irish parliament, took place in 1919. And the groups make presentations and Conor Negrega says, look, if you give us the money, we can employ somebody to go out. We're not going to publish some, some dictionary or we're not going to have an academic conference. We're going to have a community um, employee who will go out and do work on the ground. And T.D. O'Sullivan is impressed by this, awards the money to Conor Negrega, and they construct a financial arrangement which will enable them to pay a traveling organizer for a couple of years. So the money to do this, the seed money, comes from America. Then the question is, who could do this work? And they get very lucky there too, because a man called Tomas Bon O'Conkannon is on his way back from California to Ireland. Now, Tomás Bon O'Conkannon is actually a key figure in Irish history, although he's not well, that well known. And he's a very typical product of his time in some ways. Inish Mian is the middle of the three Iron Islands. Uh, in some ways, it's the most remote of the Iron Islands. He was born there in about 1870. And when he went to primary school on the island, even though Inish Mian is still one of the strongest Irish speaking or Gaeltacht communities today, the Irish language is not being taught in the school on the island. So he did not learn, although he was a native Irish speaker, to read or write Irish at school in Ireland. When he was 18, he left Ireland. Uh, money came back from America to, to help with his secondary education. So he had a secondary education in Galway City, which was also unusual at that time. When he was 18, he went to America to work for his half-brother, Seamus, who ran this place, the Concannon Vineyard in Livermore, California. Seamus was also a very enterprising individual. He had gone to California 
uh, quite early on. And he was the first person to make non-sacral wines in California. He got a scholarship to go to Harvard, spent some time in Bordeaux uh, learning the trade in France. And then he is the pioneer of the California wine industry. So a very enterprising, very business oriented person. And Tomas, Tomas education is partially funded by him. And when Tomas goes to America, he's very deeply influenced by Seamus's work there. I actually had the good fortune to visit the vineyard a few months ago before all of this craziness happened. And they showed me a photo album from the 1880s and 90s that they have and all of the entries are written in Irish. And for me, it's just crazy to think that there's a vineyard in California and there's a photo album and everything is in Irish. It just shows you how interesting the world can be. The Moss learns the trade. He also learns how to sell the wine, go out on the road, talk to people. He's even sent down to Mexico to manage the vineyard of the president of Mexico's daughter for a while. And that's where we think this picture was taken, probably in the early 1890s. Um, and he decides, he, when he's in Mexico, he actually says this in his memoirs, he saw the Irish language written down somewhere. He says he was sitting on a hacienda and somebody gave him a newspaper printed in Irish. And that again, it was like a kind of a conversion experience for him. He was a man from the Gaeta, an Irish speaking area. He had never known that you could read and write Irish. He just hadn't thought about it. It had never been shown to him. And this really impacted on him. And he became intensely interested in this and took subscriptions to every journal he could find written in Irish, got into touch with all kinds of organizations. And in 1898, he decided it was time to visit home. His mother was old, um, in poor health, and he visited Ireland. During that summer, he met Porrick Pierce for the first time, who actually reports on meeting him in Inishmian. It's Porrick McPierce's first journalistic article. And he was in contact with Conor Negrega's circles. And they decided that he was a really unique personality from the Gaeltacht, native speaker, completely imbued with the philosophy of the revival, and also a salesman, a trained and experienced American style salesman who they could really get to go out on the road and talk to people about the Irish language. So they asked him if he would do the job. And even though the pay was far less than what he would get in America, and it was clear the work was going to be tough because the weather in Ireland is not exactly like the weather in California. And the roads in Ireland at that time were really awful. Some of the stories the traveling organizers tell about the accidents they had on bicycles are really quite horrifying. He really wanted to do this. So he took the job, went out on the road, and between 1898 and 1902, they went from 40 branches to 400 branches. And they continued to increase from there. And as the organization grew in rural areas, and the money, not a lot of money, but enough, came in from memberships and enabled them to pay other teachers. So I'm going backwards now, sorry. Move forward. So by later on, this is kind of what Tomas looks like. He, he's looking a bit more serious than he looked in Mexico. He's lost the, uh, the Colt revolver. He's lost the dog and the sombrero. He's gained the high collar. He's, well, actually, he always had that. He's very stiff and very formal. He looks a bit like a priest. And he was very strict, actually. There are really interesting accounts of his, um, how hard he was on his uh, co-employees. But he, he insisted on high standards. He's a very complicated man. And... Inside Conor Negrega, there's a huge amount of fuss about this guy. They can't believe they've been able to get this person to do this job. And some of the talk about Tomás Vaughan verges on the uh, hagiographic. So they give a brief account in the Clive Sullish, which is Conor, Clive Sullish means sword of light. It's a mythical sword of light. Um, and it was the main newspaper of Conor Negrega for about 30 years. They report on the employment of Tomás Bon, and they're trying to tell their members just how great this guy is. They give an account of his CV, uh, and there's a paragraph in there which just makes me laugh every time I read it. For such a young man, he is now some 29 years of age, Mr. Con Cannon has had a life of varied experience. He has gathered oranges in Florida. 
grapes in California, bananas in Mexico. He has seen a revolution in the streets of Santiago de Cuba and has joined the thousands that thronged the, uh, the, to witness the bullfights in the cities of the old kingdom of the Aztecs. Like all Iron Islanders, Mr. Concanon is a man of splendid physique. He belongs to that physical type so characteristic of the islands, and of Inishmian in particular, tall, lithe, and active, rather than robust, with muscles of steel, and that graceful, dignified carriage of the body and head, which betrays an Irish man, an Inishmian man all over the world. The feature strong, handsome, and expressive. An excellent linguist, he speaks Irish and even Spanish much more fluently than English, which, however, he writes with great power. A man of untiring perseverance, gigantic energy, and sterling business qualities, he is emphatically the right man in the right pay place. Now, if you could ever get an endorsement like that, if you're moving on to another job, actually, to be honest, if I read a reference like that for, for, for somebody, I might be a little bit skeptical. But it's the 19th century. They talked about things in a different way. So he's, a, he's extraordinarily influential, and he writes a kind of a manual for these traveling organizers, or they're also called Timory, in which he instructs them how to analyze the power structure in the local population, who are the sort of opinion leaders, influencers, if you will, that's what we would probably say nowadays, how to get meetings with them, how to get them working, or at the very least, to stop them opposing what you're doing, how to get the use of schools and buildings and so on, and get an organization going on the ground, and how frequently you need to come back to reinforce the work you've done. It's essentially a sales manual for the Irish language. And um, by 1903, summer of 1903, this is the organizing staff. So in five years, they've gone from one to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Timory. Uh, most of these guys have a, a Gwaeltacht, or Irish language community background, native Irish speakers. Many of them have spent some time abroad or have had some other influence on them rather than coming straight from their communities. So they're a very interesting bunch of people. And the work they're doing day in, day out, going into schools, into buildings, into parish halls, knocking on the doors of houses, talking to people, it's really creating a, a change, a shift in mentality. And there's a lot of work to be done analyzing exactly how these people spoke and what they said and exactly how they influenced the communities. We know, however, from the witness statements that veterans of the War of Independence, for example, gave to the Bureau of Military History in the 1940s and, and 50s, that many of them remembered the talks these people gave. Doing things like, for example, this wasn't just teaching Irish language classes, although that was the central thing. Father O'Hanrochoin, who is the man in the back row, third from the left, very artistic type, he would create slideshows about Irish history, and he would carry a magic lantern around on his back while cycling. And they would take a sheet, a bed sheet, stretch it between two trees late at night, and you have to imagine a village or a group of people from a few houses meeting together, showing slideshows from Irish history. Own Rua O'Neill escaping from Dublin Castle, St. Patrick, famous battles, things which were not being taught in the schools because the English education system in Ireland was designed on an imperial basis. It, it, it had a job to do. And the education that kids in Ireland or in New Delhi or in Africa or in Canada was getting was pretty much the same. They were taught, being taught to be English, to value English things, to be interested in English history and to think of themselves as part of the British Empire. The Timory and the traveling organizers of Conor Nguega were pushing back very strongly against that. And there's a lot of work to be done on the effect that their work and their adult education and, and their education of kids in schools had on, on Ireland and the Irish mentality at this time. And I think it's no coincidence that when Irish separatism re-emerged, reinvigorated, much, and much more, in a much more disciplined and potent way uh, in the years following this, that it was very clearly influenced by this and that a lot of the branding and the, the look and the terms used for 
uh, political parties and institutions were very strongly influenced by this work. This is a photograph again from the archives, which shows Pader in full flight, Pader Hanukhan in full flight at a fesh in Karbra near Skibreen in 1907. And again, you know, 1893, the organization is founded. 1898, it's still not really going anywhere because there's no money, but by 1907, with the money, with Konkanen's influence, and with the recruitment of these really energetic, engaged, charismatic young people, there's an explosion in the movement. And that combined also with money raised in a really huge fundraising tour of the United States by the president of Conor Douglas Hyde in 1905, 1907. It's become a very strong organization, which is playing a huge part in national life. As a small, just a small diversion, just for a few seconds, when Hyde is in America in 1905 and 1906, he is treated in the United States as a result of all of this work, very much like an unofficial head of state. He's received in every city by mayors and dinners are hosted for him. Uh, and he, he is very much seen as, as, the, as the acceptable face of Ireland in America. Uh, and the respect paid to him, in a sense, is a way of paying respect to what's going in Ireland, in the sense that there's a new confidence there, that something is different, and that maybe something is going to happen. And we don't have time today to go into all of the things that happened during the War of Independence of the Easter Rising and, uh, and all of that, but to make a long story way too short, uh, what's called the Irish Free State emerges as a result of all of that and the, the negotiations and the treaty settlement with England. And the name of this state is the Sairstoth Ser Airn. So the official name of the state is in Irish. Um, and the official iconography of the state is very influenced by Gaelic and Irish culture. Uh, all of the institutions have at least that look, although of course, underneath and inside the bureaucracy, it's often not quite what it looks like on the outside. And the English language, of course, having been so strong for so long and having played such a key role in the institutions for such a long time, it's still very, very strong. And throughout the 1920s, there's a huge amount of discussion of what the state's policy towards the Irish language should be. So to finish up, uh, we were going to talk a little bit about the situation with the Irish language today as a result of these things. Um, and the point I think that's really important to get across in that is very frequently facile comparisons are made between revival movements, efforts in various jurisdictions. And it's difficult to make fair, dispassionate comparisons because the circumstances are really so different in each place. And very often today uh, in Ireland, you, you'll find sometimes with some Irish language speakers, there's a great sense of disappointment actually, and, and a sense that, that things, that promises that people felt were, were made or possibilities that people felt were there were, were simply not fulfilled. And I think the picture is much more complicated. We talked a little bit about the difference in the repression of measures in Poland and in Ireland. And you can see that the measures in Poland are coming from two authorities and they're very targeted. But they also, 160 years is not a short amount of time, but it is considerably shorter than six or 700 years, which is the case in Ireland. Um, and uh, also the fact that in Ireland, there's no folk memory of an older centralized Irish state. There's also no standardized Irish language at that time. So I'm gonna do a very brief summary of the things which were achieved by the Irish language revival. And I will also list some of the things which people hoped to achieve and which were not achieved. So some of the things that were achieved were the status of the Irish language was radically changed from being a language associated exclusively with poverty, decline, and with unsophistication and ignorance to something that was valued and that was recognized as, have, as, as being a good in itself um, and a very, very valuable part of Irish heritage and tremendous efforts were made to preserve that knowledge, to collect the folklore uh, and to make sure it wouldn't be lost for future generations. Second, the Irish language as it was in the 1890s, uh, there, were there were more native speakers than there are today. 
and probably more what we call daily active speakers of the Irish language than they are today. Those speakers had not learned to read and write Irish in school. So they may have been literate in English, but they couldn't read or write in Irish in many cases. Uh, the estimates for how many people could, uh, were literate in Irish at that time are very, very low indeed. We're talking about triple digits. And uh, there was a lot of work put into creating a modern literature in Irish and also working on the language to try to create some kind of acceptable official standard. When I worked on the digitization of our newspapers, the, the variations in spelling and dialect are tremendously wide. And this was a big issue, especially when the Irish state came to be formed and you had to have questions like, well, how are we going to write laws down in Irish? Are we going to have, we're going to have a version in each of the four dialects? And if so, which one will actually be authoritative in court? You can imagine the recipe for chaos that that would be. So there was a huge amount of work put into creating an official standard in Irish. And it took 40, 50 years to do that. It wasn't until the 1950s that an official state standard for the Irish language was worked out. The Irish language in the Sairstoids, what later became the Irish Republic, the 26 counties which became independent, it became a core part of the education system at all levels. Uh, knowledge of the Irish language was required for entrance to university. Uh, and official recognition was given to Irish speaking areas, or Gwethachti, which meant that there were some differences in the state policy in those areas. Although there are many who would say that not quite enough attention was paid to those places and that much more could have been done or could be done. Uh, but they were recognized and their distinctiveness was at least officially, in ideological terms, valued. By contrast, in the six counties in the Northeast, which remained part of the United Kingdom, which became the state of Northern Ireland, active repression of the Irish language continued and even intensified in the 1920s and 30s. The progress that Conor de had made bringing Irish into the schools was pushed back very strongly. And today the figures for Irish speakers per capita in Northern Ireland are much lower than they are in the Republic. And, and uh, the various levels of knowledge of the Irish language, basic or otherwise, are much, much lower in the North than they are in the South. And there were two Irish speaking areas, Gwedachthi in the North, which don't exist at all anymore. So there are key differences. And since the 1960s, uh, there has been a big push in the Irish Republic to create Irish medium schools, uh, what we call Nimri, or they're like kindergartens, um, and Gaelskolina, uh, or the, the Irish language medium schools, or Skolina Lawn Gaelach is another term for them, and also secondary schools. And there's a big demand for those schools uh, that they're generally oversubscribed. Uh, we could probably have 50% more of them, and they'd also be full. At the same time, while those schools exist, many people uh, utter concerns about the standard of Irish in those schools and whether or not those schools really equip kids to be, to be um, functional Irish speakers later in life. And then questions are also asked about why, if so many kids attend those schools, so few of them become active speakers of the language later on. So it's a very mixed picture. And if your standard is that the island would become completely Irish speaking again, well, clearly that didn't happen. If your standard is that the Irish language would, be, would continue to be spoken, clearly that did happen. And there's official backing there, although there can be more, and that's, that's a whole conversation itself. And there is recognition there, and there are things which are happening, which are positive. Institutions have been created, which will, even in the worst case scenario, continue to provide a context for the Irish language. So it's not a story that's over. This, this talk was about history, but it is also about the present. And here in 2020, the Irish language continues to exist, continues to be spoken. And there are a lot of people who would like to ma make sure that continues to be the case and would like it to be in an even healthier state in the future. So that's really my, uh, my bit for now. Is there anything you want to add to that, Marlena? Yes, I would like to say that uh, nowadays Irish remains a very important part of Irish identity. So, you know, even for people that are not, um, let's say, active speakers of Irish, um, the language remains important. So that, uh, no, because in order to develop a kind of ethnic or national identity, it's, it does not only take a feeling of kind of community uh, but also it's about 
being different from some other important groups for a given community and in this case uh, of course these are the English so you know the like nowadays in the era of globalization we all kind of watch the same films probably we listen to the same music read the same books more or less uh, but then the language remains something that uh, makes the Irish people uh, distinct yeah that's uh, kind of indeed shows that they're different from the English and it is important. Also, uh, there's a lot of literature still being produced uh, in Irish, which I would say is also very important here. So it's not that the language is dead, like, you know, and people are trying just to revive it, bring it back to life somehow, but uh, you know, it's still the language that is used that um, keeps up with modern times so to say and you know there's literature produced so that shows but it's a living language and it has still a lot um, to offer i would agree and as a small last example one of the typical things that happens in modern um ireland or with modern use of irish is exactly that thing of the irish language being used as a marker of identity even when it's it's maybe by people who don't speak irish and over the last few weeks uh, in the Tour de France, the French bicycle race, an Irish cyclist was doing very well in the race. Uh, he, he wore the green jersey and actually he won the green jersey in the end uh, for best sprinter. Uh, and, uh, on an English television program, this happens regularly. The commentators, when an Irish sports person starts to do well, they start to talk about them as British. And this really annoys people in Ireland a lot. And the response to this was actually tweeting in Irish about this. Even he did it, and not only did he do it, but one of the EU commissioners, the main one who is negotiating the Brexit agreement with the United Kingdom, tweeted congratulations to this cyclist in Irish. And this, of course, in Ireland, it's, got, it's partly a joke. It's partly like there's a lot going on <laughs> psychologically and culturally in these things, but it's a very good example of how, of really where the Irish language is today. There is a community. Our speakers, there is, there, there's, there is vigor there, there is energy there, but it is not this, this kind of great project of everybody speaking it or, 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 or huge and exponential growth. That's not there, but it is there. And even amongst people who are not participating actively in the Irish language community, there are very few really strong opponents of the Irish language or people who are really pushing it back, um, apart maybe from a few people who don't know better uh, in the North. Um, so I think that's a fairly honest and, uh, yeah, as I said, dispassionate, uh, let's say half-time score in the Irish language revival and probably a good place for us to stop talking and listen to it.